Uh, and welcome everybody. Welcome to our first call of 2019, the 2019 First Citizens Climate Lobby Call. So um, if you're someone that's been a chapter for the last 10 years, or if you're brand new, welcome to our call. Um, we added uh, 14 chapters from nine new countries this year, and the most recent one was from Kadima, Nigeria. So if there's a fun, lucky chance that Nigeria is on today, welcome, but welcome to all of you. I wanna go back to the December call for just a moment. And if you remember in the December call, we were kind of pretty excited, whipped up into a frenzy that the House had introduced the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act, the first bipartisan climate pricing bill in basically a decade in the House. So what's happened since last month's call? Well, almost identical bill got introduced in the Senate. So now you have a time where for the first time in basically a decade, you have the carbon pricing bill in the Senate and in the House, and that they're both um, bipartisan. We expect the House bill to be back out shortly. The Senate's going to be a little bit more of a, of a, you know, a little bit more time. But we do expect the Senate, the House bill, to be coming out shortly. Also, when we kicked off the House bill, we issued a challenge saying that the most letters to the editor that we'd ever gotten in one month was 420. So we set a lofty goal of 421 letters during the month of December, and what you actually did was 604. So 604 letters to the editor alone in the month of um, December. In addition to that, also 102 op-eds, that's the most op-eds we've ever had, and then 17 editorial um, by, by the newspaper themselves. So that was really, really significant. Also during the month of December, we had a $1 million matching pool where um, uh, 100 people had committed $10,000 to create a $1 million match. That was a big stretch for us. That's more than we've ever asked this organization to raise. <clears throat> Between Giving Tuesday and December 31st, 2,982 people donated $1,221,529. So holy cow, wow. Uh, also, one of the things we've done in the last few years is open the June conference on, the, on today, but we're going to wait till February. And I, w the reason for that is two things. One is um, all the work that had to be done to get the specific websites, et cetera, for the bill ready, and also the relaunch of community. I hope it was the same way as it, for you as it was for me, it is the day the bill was introduced, all of a sudden you see all these resources and websites that are set up just to support the bill. That kind of blew me away, and I, I thought it was good for our marketing, our communications, and our IT teams to be working on those things and delay opening the conference uh, a month. But I, you know, the June conference has been a life-changing experience for me every time. I have no idea what it's going to be like when we're on the Hill with a bill in play. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to that. Okay, so um, our guest today, Amanda, Amanda Ripley, got our attention when we started seeing some of the pieces that she'd written. She's a reporter who practices solutions journalism that digs below oversimplified narratives to get to the deeper truths about people and society. In the process, she has come across a way to address conflict that results in a more satisfying outcome. So we're always interested in how do you resolve complex Democrats, Republicans, all kinds of issues like that. And so she says, complicate the narrative. I read that, I'm like, holy cow, what do you mean complicate the narrative? So anyway, as soon as we saw that, we've been very excited to have her on the call. And um, thank you so much for making yourself available today. We've been looking forward since we st first started reading your material to have you here. And thank you for joining us today, Amanda. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I um, am so impressed to see all of you here on a Saturday gives me hope, definitely. Um, I wanna thank Mark and Amy and Ricky and everybody for uh, inviting me and for allowing me to put this off a couple of months so I could coach my son's soccer games, <laughs> which are on a Saturday. Um, and uh, I'm really glad to be here. I feel like, you know, I'm not obviously not a climate expert, but I am a journalist. And when you think about what we're trying to do, I, I hope on a good day, we're trying to do some similar things. So I hope I can be helpful to you. We're all interested in um, informing people so they can make good decisions and sometimes persuading people and listening to people and being heard. So I will start with a short story, which is basically after the 2016 election, I felt very 
disoriented uh, about my profession. I'd been a journalist for 20 years, working for Time Magazine and writing books and writing for The Atlantic. And uh, I didn't know what to make of what had happened and the division in the country. At the same time, some of my colleagues in the national news media were feeling um, more convicted than ever. Like they felt like what they were doing was more important than ever and they were just doubling down on doing it. Uh, well, only with more, like more stridently maybe. <laughs> and, uh, and I felt like, wow, I don't know if that's true. Like, I think your intention, our intention is very important, but I'm not sure we're having all that much impact, uh, certainly less impact than we had had in other times in my lifetime. So uh, I spent a few months hanging out with people who understand conflict differently than journalists. And this was actually the idea of David Bornstein, who runs something called the Solutions Journalism Network. Um, and he suggested this to me. He ran into me and he was like, what are you working on? And I told him that I was like, you know, trying to figure out polarization. And I, but I didn't feel like that frame was quite right. And he said, uh, yeah, it sounds like you don't know what you're working on. And I said, uh, yeah, you're right. And he said, well, why, why don't you spend a few months hanging out with people who do conflict differently than journalists? You know, like he had been exposed recently to some conflict mediators and obviously psychologists, sociologists, um, diplomats, ministers, rabbis, all these people deal with conflict every day, right? But they do it differently than journalists. So we could see if there's something we could learn. And I'll admit that I started out skeptical. Like I felt like, you know, Really, like I kind of feel like I know conflict. I've covered terrorism and crime and disasters and abortion and gun control. How much more could I learn about conflict? But I also knew that I didn't know what else to do. <laughs> so I spent a few months hanging out with these people. And I want to tell you that it was very humbling. Like it turns out there was a lot that I did not know about conflict and how people behave, particularly when they get to a point of high conflict, which means, you know, sort of us versus them, uh, good versus evil, where things get very clear, right, in your head, any kind of entrenched polarizing conflict. And it turns out people behave very differently in those conflicts than what I had expected. And that, of course, includes myself, right? But there was just a lot I didn't know. And um, I think a good analogy is the way that economics used to assume, right, that humans were basically rational and the market was rational and that if there were mistakes that were made, the market would correct. Uh, but Daniel Kahneman and other psychologists eventually convinced economists, most of them, not all, that actually, you know, people make predictable errors and it's important to understand those and build those into your model and then we have behavioral economics. I don't think journalism has made that transition and I don't think most professions have made that transition. You know, journalists understand how to make you angry, how to get your attention, how to make you sad, but there's a lot we still don't take into account when we try to inform the public, when we try to listen, when we try to be heard. So doing the same thing in a time of high conflict is really not going to work. So I want to tell you an anecdote from one of these uh, adventures that I went on and see if this might be helpful to you. And I think we're going to have time for Q&A. So uh, please be thinking about that, be sending in your questions, because I'd love to see how we can make this more useful to you. Um, but let me pull up my um, slides here. So um, there is a place at Columbia University called the Difficult Conversations Laboratory. This is a real place that for uh, the past decade has hosted and recorded about 500 awkward, tense, painful conversations <laughs> between strangers about things that are highly loaded, like the Middle East peace process, like climate change, uh, abortion, other things. And they study how people behave in these conversations. And one thing that they noticed was you could basically divide most conversations into one of two categories. There were conversations that really were pretty negative, where people just kind of got stuck. Um, they just were frustrated and angry. And sometimes these conversations had to be stopped before the official 20 minutes was up, right? Um, but then there were other conversations that looked more like this when they charted people's sentiments throughout the process. They were, they were still, these people were still experiencing moments of frustration and anger, but they also cycled into other feelings of 
humor or even understanding or curiosity and then back to frustration and then into humor and curiosity. So you get this real difference, right? It sort of looks like a tug of war for the stuck conversations and a real complicated, much more constellation of feelings for the better conversations. And in these better conversations, people asked higher quality questions um, and they left the lab more satisfied. They did not change their minds, right? And sometimes when I say this, people are like, well, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, what do we care then if they didn't change their mind? The thing is, what we know, right, is that when people are very entrenched, they're not gonna change their minds on something deeply held in 20 minutes. But what we can hope for is for them to open their mind. People will not be open to new information if they don't feel a little bit curious sometimes, if they can't cycle out of negativity and anger, if they can't ask questions, right? So this, I think, is what we really want to get people to, is this, is this more complicated place, right? Um, so if you think about what makes a better conversation, right? You might think, oh, it's the people, it's, it's their personality, it's their history, their education. And sometimes that's true, but what the folks at Columbia wanted to figure out was whether they could induce these better conversations artificially. If they could find a way to make things more like this. And so what they did is they tried giving people something to read before their conversation. And they had half the people get a sort of traditional news story about some other complicated subject, say gun control. And the traditional news story would present one side and then the other side, right? And then they had half the other people in the treatment group read something on the same exact subject with many of the same facts that was just written in a more complicated way, a way that explicitly acknowledged that this is complex, that there are many different points of view, not just two, that there's a history and reasons for some of these points of view. And what they found is that people who had read the more complicated story went into the lab and had much higher quality conversations. So this is actually a really big deal, I think, because it shows us that you can induce complexity and curiosity with complexity and curiosity. And so this seems like there's lots of different ways to apply this. It's fairly obvious for journalism, but you know, just doing a traditional story, which has both sides, actually often ends up leaving people more entrenched in their pre-existing belief, right? Um, so more broadly, some of the things that I took away from what I learned, I did about 50 hours of mediation training and went to a lot of different places with people who worked all over the world in different kinds of high conflict, is that there are just different rules of engagement when you're in a polarized subject. And, and one thing that you hopefully already know, but bears repeating, is that facts do not persuade. And I, I say it bears repeating because I knew this too, but I didn't like really viscerally believe it. <laughs> I was not persuaded by this fact. <laughs> so I think uh, it takes time to really absorb this in your bones. So when people are emotional, facts are not, facts must be preceded by trust, right? And the second is that people will not listen until they really feel heard. This is super annoying, right, to us, but it is really like the key to the kingdom for human behavior in any kind of conflict, whether it's with your teenager or your spouse or uh, somebody who doesn't agree with you on climate, right? So people need to feel like they've been heard. I'm gonna talk more about how you can do that, but this is really important. When it comes to stories that I write, it means that I need to make sure that people see their point of view in the story. And even if I then try to debunk it or dismiss it, it needs to be heard. They need to feel like it was heard. Um, and the last one is it's easier to get rid of an, uh, it's harder to get rid of an existing identity than it is to create a new one. Uh, so this again, may be something you know, but it's important that we focus on creating new identities around change we want to happen. Identities as Americans or as Nigerians or whatever it may be, but some transcendent identity. Um, so if the goal is to complicate the narrative in order to induce open-mindedness and understanding and curiosity, one way to do that is to prove to people you are listening. Um, this is something that I thought I did. I would interview people, you know, all the time and I would go, hmm, hmm, yes, ah, I see. <laughs> That's not it, actually. So <laughs> what it is, is when someone says something that has any emotion in it, you need to really listen to what seems important to them 
try to distill it into its most articulate form that you can muster and play it back to them. So when they tell you that they don't believe these facts, they're upset about this, then you need to say, sounds like you really don't believe this because of X. And then two magical things happen. The first is they correct you when you're wrong, which is way more often than we think. And secondly, they feel heard. So you can literally see it. Like people will say, exactly. And you see it, like you see their guard kind of come down a little because they feel heard. Doesn't mean you agree with them. It means you heard what they said. And that's ultimately 99% of what people want, right? When they're in conflict is to be heard. Um, the other thing that's really important is to ask better questions. I'm going to go through this quickly, but you have the slides or you can get them if you like any of these questions. And I'm also interested in hearing if there are ones that you'd like to add to this list. But questions to ask when people are entrenched. These are questions that hopefully get us past the usual talking points and gripes and into the deeper reasons for why people believe what they believe. And when you do that, you can find that there's more common ground, right? And certainly more interesting truths to be learned. Some of these I ask now, I actually keep them on a post-it note by my uh, computer and I ask people all the time, that's my timer to remind me to shut up soon. But uh, I, these are things that I find really helpful even when I'm interviewing academics about things that aren't super emotional. They care about what they do. So it's important to ask them, you know, what is oversimplified about this issue? And uh, you'll get much more interesting, useful answers. The third and final tip I want to leave you with is um, one also you may know, I don't know, but this most people don't know this, and that's that infographics are a much more powerful way of explaining something that people don't want to hear. So Brendan Nyhan's done some great research on confirmation bias, and he's found that when you give people information they don't want to hear that doesn't fit with their pre-existing biases, if you do it visually, they're much more likely to take it in. So what this means, this is maybe my favorite tip because it's the easiest to execute, which is invest in people who are good at creating data visualizations, right? And share those data visualizations and bring them to meetings and put them out on Twitter and do that all the time, have them ready. So when the news cycle makes something you're interested in relevant, you don't just have to say it on Twitter, right? You wanna show it. And it's much more effective than me telling you how many deaths there have been in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right? It's just people believe it. They're much more likely to believe it. Um, so those are three things that I would recommend. Um, you can practice them with your kids. I certainly do every day. <laughs> the looping is a really good one. I still have to develop some parenting infographics, but uh, I'm working on it. Um, and now we'll open it up to questions. I just want to um, make sure that you know that you can reach me as well through Twitter and on email. And if you'd like to see the full report that we published, um, you can go to my website, which is amandaripley.com. We just created the audio version as well because the demand for the piece was much higher than we expected. So you can listen to it on your next road trip. Thanks so much. Great, fantastic. Ricky will monitor the questions in the chat, but um, you know, we, it's not just that we spend a lot of time going to members of Congress and their staff, but we do a lot of tabling. And you know, you never know what kind of person is going to walk up to the table. And so, you want me to uh, just roll through more? There's a question in here from George. Yeah, right, Ricky. I think Amanda, you had asked as well if people had any other ideas for the types of questions they thought might complicate the narrative. To type them into the chat, that would be great, and we can uh, look at some of those. Um, the Charlotte, North Carolina chapter want to know. While well, I ask this question, though, Amanda, can you put that list of questions back up again sure. on the screen? Okay. And then the question uh, that we got from George in Alaska is. Um, when it comes to solutions journalism and just journalism in, in general uh, and when they're writing about conflict, um, you know, how likely it is or, you know, how does the business model and how journalists act today with deadlines and stuff, you know, how does that get in the way or does that get in the way and, and do you see a lot of this solutions journalism being practiced? It definitely gets in the way. Um, it is very hard to do looping when you've got, you know, two minutes to interview someone. Um, it is particularly hard for live broadcasts, obviously, but I don't think it's as hard as people think, to be honest. If you think about most reporters, 
the vast majority, they're going to have five minutes to interview someone. If you don't loop them at all, that's a lost opportunity. The content you get is going to be less interesting and less useful and less surprising. And what journalists want is interesting, useful, and surprising information, right? <laughs> and so if you can get pound for pound, minute per minute, more useful information, I think it can be done. I don't think the business model, well, we don't really have a business model for good journalism right now. So that's a bigger problem. Um, but the one small bright light is that more and more media outlets are moving to a, trying to move to a subscription model, right? Which has its pluses and minuses. But the bottom line is if you want people to pay to come back and see you more than once, not just drive by clicks, you're going to have to develop a relationship with them. And that means listening to them, soliciting ideas from them, getting their feedback and writing stories and, and building stories that are more um, surprising and not just outraging. Um, so that there is good reason to believe that the membership model for media lends itself to more complicated narratives. Great. Great. And, and Amanda, almost everybody can see the screen, but there's some people that can only hear. Can you read those six questions and then Ricky oh, will sure. give you the next set of questions? Yeah. Um, what is oversimplified about this issue? How has this conflict affected your life? Again, if you can get personal, if you can get people to be personal, you get much better stuff because people's lives are complicated and they know them. What do you think the other side thinks of you? This is one of my favorite. Um, Me too. <laughs> okay, good. You know, <laughs> you know, and you really, it's also the tone. Like the way I said it wasn't quite right. I should say, what do you think the other side thinks of you, right? Like genuine curiosity is contagious. So you really want to bring that and not fake it, but really feel it. And then the, the best is the follow-up question, which is, okay, what do, you, what do you want the other side to know about you? And uh, not, so, so you're kind of forcing people to step back and reflect, right? And, and you'll get really interesting, thoughtful answers, not the usual, you know, uh, they're trying to take away my guns, whatever. Um, where do you feel torn? Like, where do you feel torn? This is from Jay Rosen, who writes often about the media. Um, and it, this is a great question. You can ask it different ways, right? But it's basically like, we, it acknowledges that we all feel ambivalence about things we hold dear. None of us fits neatly into the Republican or Democratic Party uh, or pretty much any other identity. So this is a good question. And the last one, this is the one I use when someone says something to me that I like just leaves me dumbstruck, um, like maybe something really outrageous. This assumes I'm not live, right? Like I'm doing a print story, so I don't have to, this isn't like for an audience. <laughs> but if someone says something to me really, that I find really offensive, I will say, tell me more. <laughs> because what I used to do is I would just, end the call or change the conversation because I would be so distressed by what they said, right, internally, that I didn't want to go down that road. I just felt like, whoa. But if I say, tell me more, you might find there's something useful to you past that. Tell me more is not the same as I agree, okay? And it's important to know that. Great. Great. Uh, 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 Ricky, there's a lot of discussion in the chat. Go ahead, Ricky. Sorry. Yeah, there's, there's one uh, uh, question about, I think about 80% of the questions are coming in about this, um, the, the, about the infographic, but then also about the earlier statement that facts don't matter. So if you can reconcile those two things, because, you know, infographic basically being facts in a visual way, right? And uh, <laughs> when people understand why that uh, seems to be in opposition. Yeah, you're right. That's a good point. You got me. I mean, I think what I should say is fa not that facts don't matter. What I, I think what I said is facts don't persuade. And what I should have said is facts don't persuade in isolation, right? So facts alone do not persuade. But if they are presented carefully with a care package of listening, right, curiosity, complexity, all those things make it possible for facts to be persuasive. And what I mean here is in particular when people are on the other side of an issue, right? If it's something that you don't have strong feelings about, I think facts can be very persuasive, right? So I'm assuming we're talking about high conflict here. And so how does infographics fit into that? That's a good point. I guess, again, it's how it's presented, right? Me telling you a fact is not persuasive, particularly if we don't have a relationship of trust pre-existing, right? Um, 
to, to the contrary. Me, me, a journalist telling you facts you don't believe is going to leave you more entrenched than you were before I met you. But if you present something visually, right, in a way that's easy to understand and compelling, then I think what's happening is that people think they came to it themselves, right? They don't feel like it's being dictated. They feel like, oh, I looked at this and I came to a conclusion. And that's a very different psychological journey than being told something by someone you don't know or trust. Great. Uh, next question. Um, can you do a little more clarification around this, the process of a, a new identity and what you mean by that and how that may play into this, uh, you know, having these conversations? Yeah, as I was saying that, I'm like, this is too much to get into with the time we have. So I'm glad someone brought it up because this is a, there's a lot to this. Um, so the research shows us that obviously identities, so identities do matter more than facts, like that we can say, and particularly if you have a strong salient identity, right? And it could be around race or religion or nationality or a belief system, right? Um, so then what do we do if we know identities and you, your side winning matters more to you than the facts, then, you know, where does that leave us? Well, it turns out you can create new identities and help people cultivate new identities, particularly around a shared concern, a shared community problem. You can create a sense of um, identity that is uh, not in conflict necessarily with the other identities you already have. It's much harder to get people to give up their identity as a conservative or a liberal or uh, a journalist or an environmentalist. Like that you, it's hard to get people to give those up, but you can create a new identity, which is why politicians try, not all of them obviously, but some of them, to uh, talk about you know, Americans or uh, New Yorkers or whatever the case may be to try to remind us of what we have in common and trigger that sense of common identity. They don't usually succeed because they're not trusted, but that is an important piece of it. Okay, and last okay, question. Ricky, we got time for one more. Go ahead, Ricky, yeah. Yeah, last question. Um, for folks who wanna take a, a deeper dive into this concept of uh, solutions journalism and learn a little bit more, um, is there, uh, a website or a resource that you can point folks to that um, you, that you would endorse? Yeah, I'm actually really glad I should have said this, but the Solutions Journalism, so they're a nonprofit that was started by journalists and for journalists, and they have a website and just Google Solutions Journalism. And what's really cool on there is they have a story tracker that uh, they have this huge database of stories that don't just complain about problems, but actually tell you about what people are trying to do to solve the problem. Even if those solutions don't always succeed, we know from psychology that when you bombard humans with negative information about how terrible the world is, they shut down, they get uh, sort of negative and cynical, and they don't take action. When you give humans um, information about a problem and some sense no matter how distant that there is hope or that someone is trying to do something about it, they respond much, much better to that, right? So this is what solutions journalism is all about. And when it's done well, um, which is not always the case, when it's done well, and that's what the solutions journalism folks are working on, it is very powerful. You can really, you know, a lot of journalism is done um, for to try to make the world a better place and it almost never does and that's partly because journalists spend too much time in my opinion complaining and lamenting and lambasting and not very much time talking about you know where it's being done better fantastic uh, amanda absolutely fantastic i mean we we for nine years we've tried to be a better organization at communicating on climate change and Almost all of that has been about how can we become better listeners, and I think we took another big step forward today of um, really expanding our capacity to hear other people, to be curious, to be solutions oriented. So that's just absolutely fantastic. And if you could unscreen share then, and then you're welcome to stay on for the next uh, few minutes if you want to, but I know it's a Saturday. And I know what it's like to be coaching uh, little league teams because I coached a bunch of them. <laughs> so how those can take care of your Saturdays. Great. Thank well, so thank much. you so much, Mark. Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your weekend. Okay. Thank you.
Uh, I'm going to ask Amy Bennett to come on for just a moment. Uh, Amy Bennett handles our liaison program, which is our point of contact between us and every single member of the House and Senate. And we've got 100 new friends. And so I asked Amy, Amy to share an anecdote of, of how one chapter, one liaison developed a relationship with a member of Congress, because we, we, we're not just thinking about the offices we've been meeting with regularly over the years, but now there's a whole bunch of new people in the House and Senate. And um, uh, Amy, if you could go ahead and unmute yourself and just share a little bit about that, we'd appreciate it. Thanks, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, great. Well, Marianne is, is, uh, was a new liaison, a CCL congressional liaison, and she had a conservative member of Congress, and she wanted to go in and um, meet the staff and show her appreciation, so she decided to bring in some home-baked cookies for the local district office. And she learned that the home-baked goodies are okay, as long as they're under $10 or more expensive than that. And so she flipped through her favorite recipe files and found the perfect oatmeal cookies with figs. She chose a slow midday week to plan an informal meeting. And she came in with those hot cookies. Um, and she was really prepared for a very short meeting. As it turned out, it was indeed a slow day. And she was able to chat with the key, the key staffers. She introduced herself as the new CCL point person. She also asked questions and learned their preferred way to set appointments. And uh, it turns out that the, the key staffer was there and was able to suggest, oh, that'd be great, let's have quarterly meetings. She got to know a little bit about them and they got to know a little bit about her and CCL. And it just reminds us of simple things like this, like breaking bread together or a small kindness can just be the beginning of that trusting relationship that Amanda was talking about and just got her off on the right foot. And so Marianne and her chapter members went on to work with the office regularly and to move the member up the ladder of support for solutions to climate change. And her member ended up joining the Climate Solutions Caucus. So there's a story for you, Mark, thanks. Awesome, thank you so much. Just wanted to give a little bit of material there for those of you who are starting off with new chapters. So I mentioned at the start of the call that we had uh, 604 letters to the editor, which is the most we've ever had in a month. We had 102 op-eds, which is also the most we've ever had in a month. A couple other things that happened this year. We added 50 new chapters and 25,390 new members. So for those of you who are doing tables, who are inviting people to the intro call, that was a, just a huge bump for the organization last year. There were 1,391 meetings with members of Congress. So 1,391 meetings with members of Congress. That's a combination of both what happened uh, in district and in DC. Our two events are June and November. The total letters to the editor for last year was 3,583, which is the most we've ever had in a year. So th that's a lot of letters. Uh, we had 49 editorials published where the newspaper took the position that uh, they were uh, advocating for our policy. We had 547 op-eds. In terms of outreach events, there was 3,045 outreach events. And we're going to issue a big challenge. We thought that it was so much fun what happened with the challenge for the letters to the editor in December. For the first three months of 2019, we're challenging the organization to do 2,000 outreach events. The most that have ever been done in the first four months of the year have been a little bit over 1,500. So it'll be a stretch, but I think that that will be a fun game to play. And then the last piece of data I'll give you is, is that in terms of personal letters to members of Congress, last year you sent 59,966 personal letters to members of Congress. So that's pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, I want to make sure that everybody's crystal clear that we have shifted as an organization from an organization that's talking about fee and dividend to an organization that is talking about the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act. So what you'll see is everything coming out in terms of resources is actually in support of a bill, which is a big shift from a basic concept we've been asking for to actual legislation. And so for those of you who are able to come to the upcoming regional conferences over the just the next two months, there'll be regional conferences in New Jersey, the Northern California Conference in the Bay Area, Houston, which Susan Adams says is going to be an extra good one, uh, Arkansas, Florida, and then also Los Angeles for Southern California. So that's just the next two months. There'll be more in March and we'll announce those as those come along. But we'll be doing work about shifting our focus from 
a basic concept to a bill. And again, as I said at the start of the call, we are expecting the reintroduction of the House bill uh, shortly and working very hard to make something happen in the Senate also. Okay, so what are we doing this month? Well, in Canada, you'll see from your action sheets that the month of uh, January is very much focused on uh, planning and preparing and goal setting for the rest of the year. So that's all there and you, can, you will have the tools to go ahead and do that. In the U.S., um, there's going to be a lot of work of continuing to build support for the um, bill, and a lot of it has to do with outreach. So there's going to be some really good tools for tabling. There's going to be really good tools for speaking with people. You'll see that there's just a, a lot of resource to help you do outreach and build your chapter of getting more people um, towards doing this. Uh, and then the second action is we're asking people to begin the process of the in-district lobbying. So included in your action sheet is, are the dates where Congress is not in session, so they should be back in district. In some previous years, we've been very fortunate to be able to get um, additional people um, uh, actually face-to-face -face meetings with the members because the meeting is in district. And you'll see that um, those, those calendar times where we're expecting members of the House and Senate to be back in district are there. So over the next few months, you can plan your meeting, plan what you're gonna cover, and then certainly target those weeks so that there's a better chance of actually um, uh, meeting with a member. Then I love the communication exercise. There's two communication exercises for um, tabling. And the one I love in particular is the one where the Green New Deal is brought up because I think it can be frustrating that the Green New Deal gets so much coverage, which is basically a set of goals at this point. But what, the, what we want to be doing with that is not be fretting, well, why is the Green New Deal getting so much coverage? And we have a bill and, geez, we're not getting a tenth of the coverage. I think we want to be supportive and encouraging for anything that draws attention to climate change and then simply pivot back to the things that we like about the bill. And so I like the way that that, um, I like the way that, that exercise is written. It gives you a chance to practice when that comes up not being frustrated by the fact of how much coverage it gets, but rather validating, acknowledging, liking what you're hearing, drawing attention to climate change, and then pivoting to what you like about the bill. Again, let me conclude by saying this. Uh, usually we open the June conference, and I think that um, this is one time where we do give the staff uh, a chance to say, you know what, they needed a little bit of time to actually have websites and resources and tools and talking points to support the bills when they dropped. Uh, and then at the same time to actually get community redone. But on this call in February, we will be opening the June conference. And again, uh, that event, it'll be June 9th through 11th this year, has been something where I feel like my DNA is one way going in and it's a different DNA coming out. I just, I have no idea what that's gonna be like with you and I working on a bill together, but I'm looking forward to seeing what it looks like. So Ricky's gonna go ahead and everybody, mute everybody. Thank you, everybody. If you want to give a shout out to Amanda for giving a great talk again and great questions, that'd be great. And welcome to the year 2019, everybody. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>